please join me in the prayer of illumination. God of wisdom, by your spirit, may your word be proclaimed that we may know good news in our hearts and minds and bear witness to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in word and deed. Amen. The first scripture reading today comes from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. I'm always a bit intrigued by that scripture reading that Melissa shared with us, where it talks about Peter, the disciple, being in the fishing boat, and then it says he was naked, and then he put his clothes on, and then jumped into the water. You ever think about that? Okay. But that's not what this message is about, so I just, uh, but I, I thought that was... Hearing it again made me just wonder. So the second scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. I'll be beginning with verse 36. Once again, listen to God's word for us. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do, you, do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer, amen. So I find it curious how when Jesus makes his post-resurrection appearances, how often he is not recognized. I mean, people who knew Jesus, closely, intimately, like his disciples, when they encountered the risen Christ, often they could not grasp that this was the same Jesus that they had known before his crucifixion. 
I think of on Easter morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb of Jesus. The risen Jesus spoke directly to her and saying, who is it that you are looking for? And the Bible tells us that Mary thought that this was the gardener. And she says to him, if you have removed his body, tell me where it is and then I will go and get it. She did not know it was Jesus until Jesus said to her, Mary. And then she recognized his voice. And then in the 21st chapter of John, now this is weeks after Easter, the disciples were fishing off the shore of the Sea of Tiberias. They were fishermen. And when daybreak came, the risen Lord stood on the shore and they saw that figure of Jesus. But they did not know it was he. It was not until Jesus spoke to them from the shore, telling them to cast their nets to the right side of the boat, that they recognized him and said, it is the Lord. And then I think of this other occurrence, and this one in the Gospel of Luke, the road to Emmaus. This is Jesus encountering two they are referred to as disciples, but not part of the intimate inner circle of disciples who knew Jesus before his crucifixion. Jesus draws near them while they're on this road and begins to talk to them, and they have no idea that that is he. And Jesus actually asked them, well, who is it that you're talking about? Because they are still caught up in the grief of Jesus' death. And they said, well, we're talking about the prophet who was mighty in word and deed before God and all the people and how the chief priests and leaders handed him over to be crucified. We had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. They're telling this to Jesus, not realizing it's Jesus. And then from Luke's gospel we heard from today, we see the disciples gathered indoors and the risen Christ appears among them, saying, peace be with you. And the Bible says they were terrified when they saw him. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Now, I'm not throwing rocks at the disciples because they didn't recognize the risen Jesus. It's a lot to have somebody absorb that Jesus who was dead is alive again. One crucified, now raised up. What troubles me is that if these intimate followers of Jesus didn't recognize him, how are we supposed to recognize the risen Christ as his followers? Because as Easter people, we affirm that the risen Christ is here. He is present. He is in our midst. He's not a Jesus of the past. He's a Jesus of the now and the present. So I think it's telling that when the risen Jesus sees the disciples and he sees they are terrified and think they are seeing a ghost, that he shows them his hands and his feet, marks of his crucifixion. Touch me and see, he says, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see that I have. This is not an apparition, but a real flesh and bone person. Then Jesus asks them for something to eat, and Jesus ate the risen Jesus in their presence. And this tells us something, I think, of great significance, that the risen Jesus is still the incarnate Jesus. You know, and if Jesus became a, a human person, that aspect of who he is remains with him even as he has ascended to the Father. It's not simply that Jesus was the Word who was made flesh. Ra rather, he is the Word made flesh and continues to live among us as one who identifies with our humanness and our vulnerability, and frailty. And having lived among us, no one can take away that, that human aspect of who he is. That human imprint is an indelible mark of Jesus for all of, of eternity. I think we need to be reminded over and over again 
that when Jesus walked this earth, he walked it as a true human person. He felt in a very human way. When Jesus stumbled and fell, he experienced real pain. When he was doing rigorous labor, he sweat. You know, there was a heresy about Jesus which arose some centuries after his resurrection. It was the heresy of Gnosticism. I see Kathy's not here today. I was going to ask her to define what that was. But. Well, this heresy espoused that Jesus was not really human just kind of dressed up as a, as a human person. That is, he took on the appearance of a man, but did not take on flesh as we know it. And so when Jesus walked this earth, in essence, the Gnostic would say that he had like a human mask on his face, and they perceived him as human, but was not. Well, that is not the picture that the Bible gives us about Jesus, because Jesus acquired every human cell and microbe, which together composes the human body, and there is nothing fake about it. And that human side of Jesus is not lost on the risen Jesus. You know, people ask, why is it that God seems so disconnected from this world of pain and hurt well, through the word who became flesh and lived among us, he is as connected as can be. Notice the risen Christ, as depicted to us in Scripture, is still the wounded Christ. The resurrected Christ, the ascended Christ, is still the one who suffers. Jesus showed his fearful followers his hands and his feet, and those hands and feet bore the scars of his crucifixion. If you look at the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it's a series of visions which speak to the final consummation of God's purpose. Revelation is a book where, where you kind of stand on tiptoes and you, and you kind of catch glimpses of what the fulfillment of God's purpose is going to be. And in one of these visions, it says this. It says, I saw one slaughtered as a lamb standing near the throne. That lamb is Jesus. Even in the glory and the splendor of the highest heavens, the lamb is one who bears the marks of one crucified. You know, even if he is the elevated Christ who sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, he is still the suffering Christ, because our Lord is a loving Lord. He is a suffering Lord, and it didn't all end after his resurrection. In fact, the cross is a kind of symbol of the way that our Lord continues to suffer, a demonstration of the divine suffering that has taken place throughout all of eternity, really. You know, when God looks upon the world and he sees the, the kind of pain that we inflict upon each other, it breaks his heart. He's moved by what he sees. The cross is a demonstration of the suffering God who continues to suffer. So could it be the reason that we miss the risen Christ is because we're looking for him in the wrong places. I'm reminded of a man who went on a kind of a faith pilgrimage journey. He wanted to get a sense of the holiness and the, and the majesty of the, of the risen Jesus, so he visited various uh, holy spots, you might say, throughout the world. He decided that uh, he would visit the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, of course, he visited the Holy Land and the, visited the, the Holy Sepulchre, where it is believed that Jesus emerged from the tomb on that first Easter, as well as other holy sites in Jerusalem. And then he made a trip to this place, Rio de Janeiro, where this spectacular 98-foot statue of Jesus, carved out of soapstone, stands on a precipice overlooking 
that city, Jesus with his arms outstretched. And so he went to where the, as far up as he could go, to that precipice. And he could see, standing there, the people below. They looked like little ants crawling around on the streets and the, almost looked like little miniature cars that were driving there. Mm -hmm. And as he looked out onto this, this vista, it dawned on him that the risen Jesus was not up there. Rather, he was down there on the streets and the sidewalks. The majesty of God, the majesty of Jesus, our Lord, is not in his ability to ascend to the high places, but to stoop to the lowest ones. And what this means, if the risen Christ is still the incarnate Christ, we are the extension of that body, his hands, his feet, and his voice. People come to know who Jesus is through the words and the actions of the people who are devoted to him. It's a common theme throughout the Bible. God uses individual people to accomplish his purpose, beginning with the Old Testament, calling of Moses and Abraham before him and the prophets. God works his purpose through his people. So how incarnational are we being in our approach to life? Because if Jesus swooped, <laughs> stooped, to the lowest places. This is what he expects of us as well. I'm reminded of the story I heard about a church in Scotland it had a stained glass window, which was at the front of the sanctuary. And it had an image of Jesus with his arms outstretched like this. And it says, glory to God in the highest. Well, it just so happened that over the years, the letter E in that phrase wore off and so it said glory to God in the high no e st or glory to God on the high street in Scotland high street is the equivalent to the name of main street here in our country we give glory to God in the highest when we provide that glory on high street. And yet to do this, we must continue to be resurrection people, to draw our strength from the risen Jesus, the one who has gone before us. I will not leave you orphaned were the words of promise Jesus gave to his disciples. Jesus said, I am with you always to the end of the ages. Repentance and forgiveness of sins were to be proclaimed to all the nations, yet that could only happen with the power of the risen Jesus at work with those people who followed him. Have you ever wondered, you know, what is it that drew people to the Christian community? Those first, you know, communities of, of believers that sprung up in various places in the Mediterranean world it exploded onto the world scene. It overturned eventually empires and kingdoms. What quality was it about these people that drew others to them? You have to ask, was it because of their doctrine, their beliefs? Jesus, this idea of a cross, a suffering savior, and this ritual of eating bread and, and drinking wine from a cup and calling it his flesh and his blood? You know, they worshiped this man who was executed for sedition. It wasn't their doctrine that drew people to the Christian community. It was the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection that people could see alive and at work among those people, even as they were being persecuted for having that faith. You know, and you picture this bystander maybe coming to a location where there was this Christian community that was formed and, and shaped, and, and this bystander just kind of distancing himself and, and looking at the way these people are behaving. You know, he's been warned about them. 
about these followers and their strange worship, worship rituals, about a man who died on a cross and authorities trying to get rid of them. Well, this bystander observes the actions of these people. And even as he does not understand who they are or what they're about, he knows they're being persecuted and yet they're showing love and concern not only for each other, but for those who are inflicting pain upon them. And so this bystander is seeing this, and he's saying, you know, if these people treat one another this way, having to suffer the way that they are, I want to know more about them. I want to have what they have that makes them this way. No, it was not some intellectual curiosity. It was the power <laughs> of the hope and the strength of resurrection that pulled people into this community of faith. You know, I sometimes think we do ourselves a disservice by focusing on this historical and scientific evidence to prove the resurrection of Jesus. You know, people will talk about how there are, were physical sightings of Jesus uh, among disciples and others, and up to 500 people laid eyes on the risen Lord. And, and we speak about how, well, the corpse of Jesus was never found. Scientists talk about DNA being recovered on a shroud that wrapped Jesus's body. It's not because of what historians or scientists say that people believe in Jesus. It is seeing the hope-filled lives of those people who already believe. You know, we're living in a time when people need to see that hope in us so that they can embrace this same living Lord. People need to know that, yes, in this world there are struggles, there's suffering, there are pestilences that overwhelm us, but the words of Jesus are, I am the resurrection and the life. We're now in the season of resurrection. These Sundays of Easter, we focus on the resurrection appearances of Jesus, but every Sunday is Easter. Because every Sunday we acknowledge that Jesus is the living Lord and Lord over life. That is the wisdom that we must follow, not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom given to us in our risen Savior, the incarnational Jesus, the wounded Jesus, and the hope-giving Jesus is here and among us. Amen.